see if this works. Cambok QUPS file 71903. Ooh, remember Team Titans? Oh, I remember! Like Altera sacrificed herself to beat Slade. Like Raven never wearing pants. And now I'll go for file eleven eighteen ninety eight. Ah, remember Powerpuff Girls? Ah, I remember all the interesting villains. Annabelle and Saxon with comedy. And finally, let's bring it home with our next offender. File four fifteen o eight. Hey, remember Ben 10? Yeah, I remember! Such a diverse range of aliens! Character dynamics were awesome! Let's make our own! You see what I gotta work with on a regular basis? Without the creative juices of Craig McCracken or Dwayne McDuffie to keep them stable, the show just ends up a hollowed out show of itself at a time when the serialization is easier to comprehend thanks to streaming. But why does Cartoon Network keep churning out these episodic comedy reboots of action-oriented shows? I'd understand if you rebooted your comedies, like Johnny Bravo or Dexter's Lab, or hell, even Dust Off Yogi's Gang if you wanted to, but the fact of the matter is that you cheated regular show out of the chance to air its final Thanksgiving special in favor of giving your precious toddler twats the Every Simpsons Ever treatment for the whole fucking Turkey Day weekend. And that, sir, means I have to go three for three on you grape nuts. Well... I was gonna complete the set sooner or later. Might as well queue up my penultimate episode of the year with the baby of the bunch. Ladies and gentlemen the mob, time to riot loose with our fandom arson of Ben 10 2016, episode 14, The Brief Career of Lucky Girl. Belts up, gang. We're about to land. But before we kick things off, we need to know the aliens in this new Omnitrix Wielder's initial roster. Okay, we have four arms, heat blast, accelerate, diamond head, good so far, and hey! It's Cannonbolt! How you been, buddy? Glad to see you finally made an initial roster almost a decade after being shafted in favor of Ghost Freak. But now upgrades donning the ghoul's signature purple. Probably for cheap blood, I figure down the line, but hey! Who am I to judge when I've done three old videos on a Toys to Life series that took too long to get anywhere, am I right? <laughs> oh my god, I wasted my money. Of course, you can't really have a Mechamorph or even an Omnitrix without a Galvin race to invent such things, so Grey Matter hops in for another go at the roster. And oh look, we're actually getting aliens from the later three series, like Water Hazard, Swamp Fire, and... Is that supposed to be Big Chill? What the hell happened to your wings, man? You're supposed to be a butterfly, not a... Really? What else did I get wrong? What the fuck? And it's here where we get our first major roadblock of this show as a reboot. The aliens don't look all that alien in comparison to the aliens that we've seen in prior incarnations. What's that supposed to mean, John? With the redesigns of a bunch of these characters, it makes them seem a lot less alien and more like a costume Ben is putting on. The episode begins with Grandpa Max. Oh Jesus, we have Ted McGinley! Betrayal man of action! I call betrayal! No, unacceptable! Actually, pretty much all of the voice actors have been swapped out, with the lone exception being Tara Strong herself as the titular Tennyson himself. 
It's actually the inverse as to what happened with the Powerpuff Girls reboot, where the main heroes were swapped out while most of the main voice cast were kept around. Weak characterization neither helps nor hurts the show because it's pretty standard practice with these cheap Cartoon Network reboots. So yeah, we're stepping into Comic-Con territory this week, folks, and Gwen is going as Lucky Girl. What a surprise. Lucky Girl? Who's that? Only the greatest superhero of all time, and the inspiration for my awesome costume. Look! Lucky Girl! See? Look? That's not a superpower, that's coincidence! You're taking it too literally. Or, not literally enough? That just raises further questions! <laughs> Alright then, boys. Where are you? Ignoring that nonsensical notion of Tetraman Bishy Sparkle, Lucky Girl is a pre-existing comic superheroine. Yeah, I'll bite. What's the catch? I'm Lucky Girl. Something I can do for a day? <laughs> a Silver Age fan used as setup for a joke that obviously wouldn't work in the original art style. Neato. I'd bring up the death battle where Luke Skywalker wiped the floor with Harry Potter, but it's early DB, so it's kind of beneath me at this point. But in comes Hex to swipe a mystical artifact as per usual for his character, and naturally with the prize of the day being Merlin's personal wand, Ben's clearly in trouble. Where else? With this wand in my possession, all the world will come to bow before me, starting with you. To be clear, Lucky Girl is here. Warm. Yeah, that could probably use some work. So yeah, here's the hook of the episode. Gwen engages in practical wit and trickery to engage in her power fantasies instead of magic for a change. Coincidental comedic slapstick ensues as the two hightail it out on the spot. This is awesome! You guys are amazing LARPers! Yeah, you keep telling yourself that. Ben promptly goes heat blast the minute the LARPer bails on him, and as much as I enjoyed the original Spy Kids trilogy... Whoa, big guy! Heard of mints? Seriously, how'd you do that? How about some more lucky magic? Uh... Or else you'll get blindsided by awesomeness? Hate to break it to you, Junie. But Steve Bloom, you ain't. Gwen Lucky Girl knocks the tower down to distract the ogre and gives chase to Hex, whilst Ben Heat Blast keeps on fighting the ogre. Aw, who's a big mean ogre? You are sick. Stay. Play dead. Whoa. Mint condition collectibles. As you can probably tell, the action is a bit more prevalent than in toddler twats or power props, since Man of Action is still in the driver's seat. Same as it's been from where it began, which makes this show a lot more tolerable in the sea of cheap comedies we have now. At the dead end doorway of a sealed up panel just about to be adjourned, Gwen hides behind her now exiting fellow Lucky Girl cosplayers. Silver Age Goldie included, and the array of phony spells she spouts. Tenso, distracto, everything oh! Collapse, party oh! Uh, many me, booyah! He gets old. And apparently Hex agrees with the one time star of different strokes as his patience has all but crumbled away. Luckily, Ben pimps in to make the save as Overflow, but he ends up tangled up for Gwen to immediately pay her cousin back. So Hex is carted off by Space Marines, Potter dunks the Lego ogre to bricks, Grandpa Max gets his photo at a discounted price, and they were better off the end. The Clinton campaign in a nutshell. And naturally, Hex figures out the wants just a prop, but in comes a zombie parade to leave Hex shivering in his shoes. The undead walking amongst us. Oh, this not even Merlin himself could. Oh. The communist conglomeracy in a nutshell. So Hex is carted off by Space Marines, Potter dunks the Lego over to bricks, Grandpa Max gets his photo at a discounted price, and they were better off the end. To the holding cell with him. 
Don't forget to vote in the costume contest. I'll give this latest entry into the life of Ben Tennyson credit. At least it has a comprehensive amount of action. But with the way Cartoon Network ODs on these cheap comedy reboots these days, I feel way too sorry not to apologize to the likes of Robot Jones since, despite being a nothing new setting, the high school setup can work and has worked for many a show whose creative teams know how to make it work. Like, for example, Hell Teacher Nube or Maho Sensei Nagamiya on the Japanese side, with Danny Phantom and Kim Possible being great balances on the Western side. Heck, even Sailor Moon knew how to balance the high school elements and the superhero elements. Not as well as I'd say Spectacular Spider Man, but I digress. And I will admit that calling the animation cheap was pretty petty of me, since really this was during a time when the cell animation format whence Jones came was clearly on its way out for costing the network's hella cash. And yes, this episode does establish the downsides of Jones's method of robot puberty throughout the latter half of the episode, not to mention that I forgot the reasoning for the division between high school and middle school was for the younger middle school kids to kind of grow into their bodies before being carted off into what many young adults call the best years of their lives. And consistency be damned, Bobby Block has proven in his time in the role of Robot Jones that raw human emotion beats out just about every version of Macintosh Apple can produce. This show and the other two reboots from Cartoon Network's Play Studio we've slammed over the past year have one thing in common, one word, gentrification. Zero conflict, zero effort. Zero tension, all for the communist Chinese that own its parent company, Time Warner, to indoctrinate children into accepting the police state-run technocracy they want to install to run America, and later on the entire planet into the ground. These foppish parasites have made it their plan with the radical left, the Left Reich, as I like to call them. That's why Obama poured in all these illegal immigrants into the country. That's why the UN built up the TPP. That's why Clinton allowed those same illegals to vote. They want to crush humanity, purge the population, and put themselves on top. And if that doesn't sound like a dictatorship or a tyranny to you, then you've been suckered in by the mainstream press's propaganda branches that mask its ugliness with friendly faces, calming voices, and false promises of utopia. You might have been led to believe that a one-world governmental globalist economy is a beautiful thing, but everything that this technocratic system stands for makes its innards as hideous as you'd expect a mushy pile of disheveled vital organs. Don't get me wrong, this show's not as bad as all the others, but for what the globalists are trying to accomplish, I cannot recommend the Cartoon Network Play Studio to anyone willing to create or be heard by an audience. Well, now the left Reich's crumbling at the feet of President-elect Donald Trump, and oh my captain has radically different views on the Donald brought about by the truth-twisting of the Clinton News Network, Washington Compost, Young Jerks, and the like, I admit my faith in Donald Trump. I admit my pride in my audience for voting for this guy, if you did in fact vote for him. I admit my hope that he could make this country great again. Now let's fuck those damn globalists to death, alright? Kick logic out and do the impossible! That's the way Team Diger and Rolls, baby!